Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Established in 2007, Middle East Studies at Marine Corps University brings in guest lecturers to speak about topics of importance to the United States Marine Corps and wider Department of Defense and U.S. government communities concerning the Middle East broadly defined. In line with Middle East Studies mission, the MES lecture series and other MES talks and panels provide up-to-date information and analysis on the broader Middle East, including South and Central Asia, North and Sub-Saharan Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Black Sea and Red Sea regions. I would, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our guest speaker for today, Dr. Stigyarl Hansen, who's Professor of International Relations and the Director of the Master's Program in International Affairs at the at NMBU, Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Um, he's a internationally uh, renowned known expert on African politics and African security affairs. He is, before COVID, sort of put a, a cramp in his uh, field work. He uh, is a field working uh, uh, fiend. He, he's, he's conducted field work in, in Somalia, Ethiopia, all across Africa, in fact, the Middle East, uh, Pakistan, uh, among other places. And he has is the author of a number of books, including the first book length scholarly study of Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda affiliates in East Africa and the Horn of Africa and Somalia entitled Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the History and Ideology of a Militant Islamist Group. He's written on Al-Qaeda and ISIS-connected affiliated uh, affiliates in Africa in Horn, Sahel, and Rift. And most recently, he was the one of the lead co-editor of a, a Rutledge, the Rutledge Handbook of De-Radicalization and Disengagement. Um, he has been uh, conducted studies and surveys and fieldwork in the Horn in particular for, for many, many years, and it's our great pleasure to welcome him at MCU today to talk about strategic competition in the Red Sea Zone and the Horn of Africa. Dr. Hansen, uh, I leave it to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. And uh, it's an honor to be at the Crew Duck Center and uh, to talk here today about uh, what is a kind of new context for many. Uh, and um, uh, we have seen that uh, there has been a refocus, as most of you know, uh, on behalf of United States uh, towards uh, looking into China and uh, Russia and Chinese and Russian activities. And this is, to a certain extent, uh, a product of uh, this, uh, this uh, refocus, so to say. Uh, and uh, a refocus means that there will be a lot of more attention to the uh, South China Sea and the Asian theater of operations. Uh, but I'm going to look into the meaning of the increasing great power rivalry in the, in the African context and also in the East African context. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is increasing. Uh, there's no doubt about that, but that's also driven a kind of synergy between United States, who is refocusing, and then Russia, who is gearing up, and then China, who has its own strategies. So uh, it's uh, interesting dynamics, and I would say maybe also dynamics that can be replicated to other places in the world. And it has a lot of things to do with uh, Russian strategies. It has a lot of things to do with Chinese strategies, as well as local domestic politics. Uh, if you look into the situation in the, uh, in the Horn of Africa, uh, basically what you see is that there is an opening uh, for both Russian and Chinese engagement. Uh, it shouldn't be overestimated. If you look into Russia, for example, it's put very much weaker than it used to be during the Cold War. Uh, the China uh, also have a limited amount of tools in its uh, basically toolbox. Uh, so there are limitations to that engagement. And more uh, importantly, perhaps, the United States has a lot of allies within the security sector from the war on terror and is engaged locally. Uh, I think United States still can offer something that it, other countries cannot offer, and that is a, basically a steady uh, security uh, engagement uh, over time. And uh, I will get back to that basically, and uh, we will see it's important to watch the uh, developments to see which direction this will go. Uh, United States have to do specific calculations. Uh, 
you have to think about uh, when to engage. There's a cost of engaging. It's the cost is basically that you can be dragged into local conflicts that uh, local actors try to globalize. You can be dragged into supporting partners that you really don't want to support because of their value set. Uh, and it could be that you're exposed to manipulations. And it could be also that you use too many resources on, for example, a country that is not so important for the United States. There's also a loss for not engaging. If you don't engage, you can lose opportunities to China or Russia that can take advantage of those opportunities. And several researchers would say, I'm not fully in agreement with that, that this is maybe something that is happening in Ethiopia today. Um, and uh, there is a loss of engaging and there's a cost of engaging, but we should keep in mind, and I think this is very important, and I will show you that a little bit later, uh, that uh, this calculus, the cost of engaging and not engaging, it depends on the targets uh, from uh, China and Russia as well. What we see over and over uh, again is that the uh, United States engaged in a security context, but China, since it has looser demands and somewhat uh, more flexible interests, can engage economically and then nevertheless have considerable influence in some uh, uh, when it comes to some issues. We can see United States engaging in security cooperation, China engaged economically, and then China nevertheless managed to buy support for its politics, for example, against Uyghurs uh, in regards to Hong Kong uh, or in regards to Taiwan. So it's possible to try for China to have some kind of influence, although it's not directly security related, and even when United States have uh, influence as well. So. Uh, the calculus remain dependent, uh, dependent a little bit on the issues. And we can see also sometimes that Chinese engagement can be used for spying because of this, because China can actually build up infrastructure very close to American bases, like in Banda Bay, like in Djibouti. Uh, and uh, we then see uh, China having the ability to use some of those resources to, to engage in uh, surveillance of uh, United States uh, at time. So, so there, there is different degrees of dangers when it comes to what China can do on one side of the spectrum. It's like the solid military partner of one of the countries with bases, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, it's more simple things on the other side of the specter, like getting their, uh, the country's support in relations to Uyghurs, getting support in the relations to Hong Kong policies of China. Uh, and the, the specter is going between the, these two uh, ends. Uh, Russia seemed to have a much more uh, power-centric uh, relationship with the Horn. Perhaps naturally, because Russia have a more military uh, approach and rather less economic approach. They have less uh, economic uh, powers. Indeed, it's, uh, I think if I remember correctly, only the 12th largest economy in the world, while China is the second and increasing. Uh, it does, however, have the advantage of uh, old weapon systems that a lot of these countries actually are using, and I will get back to that a little bit as well. Um, we have to look into the differences between Russia and China. And, and China is basically uh, growing because of its attachment to the global uh, uh, economic system. It's a pretty, uh, has been, its growth has been export driven to a certain extent. It's heavily tied up to the world system, economic system. It has more at stake with the disruption of the economic system than perhaps Russia. So it's not uh, really in its interest to play an outright spoiler a role when it comes to uh, uh, comes to uh, basically the world economic system. Uh, China has a differentiated uh, toolkit, but first and foremost, maybe the toolkit in relation to the horn is loans and private actor investments. Uh, Chinese state and private actors investment and basically tempting local countries with market access in the Chinese context uh, to have uh, access to the large Chinese uh, markets. And uh, you can see that basically uh, this is tempting for several of the countries here. Uh, you can get loans, uh, but some of these projects have been quite high risk projects. That's why, and it hasn't necessarily paid up everywhere. And we see an increase 
in the debt actually incurred to China. And the question is, what will this do in the future? Will it give China more power over these countries? And that might be one scenario, but it might also lead to some kind of counter reaction from some of these countries. And uh, it's very important to keep in mind that when you look into these countries, how much debt they have to China. And if you look into the horn, uh, Djibouti is actually the worst off here. But Ethiopia is uh, doing quite bad as well, and that can be argued that this gives some kind of power. But what's interesting in the relations to Djibouti is that we also see the limits of those powers. Uh, so, so, but nevertheless, investment is very important, both state and private investment, and floating market access. Uh, China can use this market access, and it has done so, but not in the horn to actually punish countries that do things that China don't like. For example, when Australia talked about the co origins of the COVID-19 pandemics in 2020, we saw China floating, the, that's the tool. What China doesn't have yet is the alliance system that United States has, is that had some traditional allies, they have not been stable, there have been changes, but it's not like China never was engaged in Africa. They had they had some solid partners amongst them, EPRDF in Ethiopia. Uh, but that changed. They never had the solid partnership that United States had. And although the Chinese arms export is increasing, you cannot find the Russian relationship to the various African armed forces either. When you see a lot of armed forces in Africa having a all more or less fully stocked ex-Soviet equipment that actually can benefit from Russian aid. Uh, but China will over time develop a niche capacity. Uh, so China's main strength is basically uh, the economy. Uh, and uh, basically its role in investment. Uh, we see here the Ethiopian uh, Federal Bank of Commerce, a new high status building taking place in Addis Ababa. And that's a pattern we see where do you have Chinese loans, Chinese workers coming to improve uh, local infrastructure. Uh, and that, that's both a strength and a limitation because very often they will just use that Chinese workers and Chinese entrepreneurs and very often it would be credit financed. So there are limitations, but nevertheless, it gives some kind of power. It, it is an alternative to the uh, American package, so to say. And uh, military aid, when it comes to China, has basically been limited. Uh, they have few of the major weapon systems that are outright supplied by China. If they're Chinese uh, weapons, very often they are some kind of uh, copies from, from the Soviet, old Soviet inventory. Uh, the, what we've seen is a slight change. We've seen basically that China is supplying niche capacities. If you look into Eritrea, you have, uh, for example, uh, almost uh, most of the, uh, all of the Eritrean transport planes are basically Chinese made. You have uh, basically uh, rocket launches, multiple rocket launches. 77% of all uh, Sudanese uh, are from China. So there are uh, Chinese openings for Chinese influence when it comes to specific niche capacities, but not all over the place. So Russia is better situated in, uh, than China to draw advantage of the arms market. Uh, there are some exceptions, for example, Sudan, maybe, and there are also trends that we have to look into. What we see now is, for example, wing long drones playing a larger role in the Ethiopian context. We also see rumors about self-guiding ammunitions from China uh, playing a larger role in Ethiopia. But it's not very clear how massive this is. The volume itself is not really clear. We need more sources on it. Uh, there has been uh, claims that the drones changed the warfare in Ethiopia. I'm not sure if that is the case. The, the TPLF, TDF had very vulnerable flanks. Uh, they had not dealt with the Eritrean army and they were very logistically troubled. Um, a lot of its arms would come from uh, then uh, Ethiopian uh, army stocks, depots that they actually conquered. And that's not a very durable solution. So the reversal might not be because of uh, Chinese engagement, but we see that there are some trends. But for now, China is basically into niche capacities rather than large scale capacities. So what do we see? 
uh, or what does China want to do in the war? Uh, basically, it's for no seem to be relatively limited. What you see is basically China trying to manipulate uh, basically uh, what the, it sees as interference in Chinese internal affairs. And you might wonder, will the one of Africa countries do such uh, basically interference? In large, not. What they could do is to act as a support for China to thwart this type of in, uh, what it sees as interference in its domestic affairs, basically by getting money to vote for their views in, for example, food as, as United Nations. Uh, basically, where you see uh, East African states uh, distancing themselves from Chinese uh, business interests. That's not a done deal, ladies and gentlemen, and it has been differences between uh, different states in the Horn. So what we see is when China tried to do that with, uh, for example, Kenya, it had a limited impact. It rather influenced some of the public, uh, basically, statements of the Kenyans rather to influence their voting patterns. So in uh, relations to Kenya, uh, even that limited target had some, some problems, but we've seen them over and over again. Uh, making uh, headway in other countries. Uh, we've seen Somalia backing China over Uyghurs, which is very interesting because Somalia has a stated policy to support Muslims and uh, Uyghurs are Muslims. So, so it seems like they managed to turn the government. We've seen uh, kind of Eritrea going in that direction also without much Chinese effort. So it seemed to be some kind of local consideration that well, we can get a little bit support from the Chinese, and this is kind of a cheap paid, uh, price to pay, so we go and vote in the United Nations. So the question is, well, it gives some effect, but the question is, how will that effect last if United States put more pressure on some of these countries? And we don't know fully the answer, but we know that some of the countries here, United States, is getting a more troubled relationship with. We also see that uh, basically you have a, a issue where China actively tries to secure uh, the Chinese supply chain of vital raw materials such as oil and gas. So there's some kind of active Chinese policies, not always successful in trying to get access to South Sudanese gas, in trying to get uh, access to uh, basically uh, Sudanese oil and gas, we see that they have been trying to secure fishing rights outside of Somalia, not only trying, they managed to secure them. Uh, and we also see in Chinese uh, interest in uh, basically uh, some, some uh, agricultural products and to a very limited extent also mining. Uh, so there is an interest in, in, in securing uh, access to raw material. This is perhaps also the reason behind the Djibouti uh, naval base of the Chinese Navy, uh, one of the first major bases of the Chinese Navy outside of uh, outside of China, uh, and um, securing the Bab el Mandeb and securing the logistical flow. So we see that as an interest. Uh, and uh, we see that China also have a profit interest basically where they want to earn uh, money and cash they want to do profitable investments but nevertheless chinese investments sometimes have a high risk attached to them that's very important and then you have what i said you know we have to look into the how this turns out because debt can give the chinese power but it can also create some kind of counter uh, reaction we also see in china kind of striving to intervene in Horn of Africa politics in order to basically enforce what I see as the sovereign principle, sovereignty principle, basically that uh, uh, China will react in the United Nations if it uh, sees for uh, the West, for example, seemingly pressuring uh, Sudan on internal matters. Uh, and that is highly appreciated and that uh, by some of the local strongmen, uh, including Abiyeh in Ethiopia and Abashir before he left power in Sudan. And that means that China, to a smaller extent than Russia, can draw upon so-called windows of opportunities. That's basically states with leaders that become alienated from the United States. Then China has some kind of opening. But it seems like Russia is much more uh, stronger in taking advantage of uh, of those situations, but it's there. 
uh, there are uh, Chinese efforts to take uh, advantage of the windows of opportunities. And maybe one of the strongest efforts in the horn is basically uh, targeting Ethiopia and the regime of President Abiy. It's not very strong, but we see an increased Chinese interest. We also see China defending Abiy in, in the United Nations against accusations and in other forums. So we, that, that's where Chinese uh, will try to take advantage of what they have seen as a kind of United States alienation from Abiy. Uh, and, uh, but ironically enough, we see sometimes the opposite thing is happening as well. So we saw Somaliland actively trying to engage Taiwan uh, because they lacked support for sovereignty. And that's kind of a trick that United States must be aware of because uh, by engaging Taiwan, Somaliland might receive Chinese condemnation, but it might be that that's just what Somaliland wants because it doesn't have full sovereignty. It doesn't have accepted a status of independence. This entity in Northwestern uh, Somalia wants to be independent and have to a large extent been de facto independent since 1991, but it hasn't been recognized by anybody. So you can see a kind of Somaliland strategy where they want to approach Taiwan maybe to provoke a Chinese reaction, and then maybe they want to provoke a US reaction. So it's a kind of strategy maybe to buy into a US support because they want to draw China out as maybe a, a bull in a bull fight, basically. Uh, so so uh, that's an early uh, stage, it's an early process, but that, that's kind of tricks we have to watch. We have to watch uh, very carefully how strong the United States interest is in some of these countries. And it, the United States will also be trying, there will be efforts here to manipulate the United States into supporting some kind of uh, local engagement that doesn't necessarily concern its rivalry with, uh, with China. So uh, basically, uh, for now, you have kind of limited strategic goals. It seems like this condemnation and support in United Nations with regards to, uh, or I should rephrase myself, this support in United Nations with regards to their policies against Uyghurs, Hong Kong, uh, against, uh, against the issue of Taiwan is what they're most successful at. Uh, and as I say, uh, such support can be combined with American security support in some cases. Uh, but Chinese uh, engagement also have limitations. They cannot yet offer the security package that the United States can. Uh, and they cannot be as strong as allies as the United States can if it wants to engage also in a limited way, actually. So it doesn't have the force of projection capacity. Uh, basically, what the China needs to do if it wants to rival the United States fully in that area is basically to expand its current strategy so that we see an emerging hard power rather than soft power. And it's not there, even the Djibouti base is rather limited. So we don't see those signs uh, yet either. Uh, but we've seen that they can take advantage of so-called windows of opportunity when basically United States slide away from local rulers that uh, basically have some kind of human rights uh, transgression uh, and it's observed by the media. Ladies and gentlemen, that might not always be efficient because some of these regimes that United States distance them for, uh, uh, from are not stable. So we saw that with Bashir and the Russians. We didn't see that with the uh, Chinese admittedly, but we, when it came to the Russians, they tried to take advantage of uh, basically Bashir when he was in Sudan, when he was sliding away from the Americans and he wasn't stable. So he was removed. No, the Chinese are trying to reassert themselves a little bit because they still had some connections with the military. Russia had a much larger extent of connections with the Sudanese military, but it, it's problematic sometimes because their allies are not that stable and they don't, they don't, they cannot de deliver, really deliver the security package. Uh, Russians, they can not to the extent that they did uh, during the Cold War, but they have weapons park actions that are very tempting for sometimes uh, for for some of these countries. Uh, Russia don't have the same toolkit as China, but it has a different toolkit. 
it's really a small economy. Maybe I'm overstating this, but the 12th largest economy in the world, which means interestingly enough in the, the case of uh, with regards to the Ukraine and, uh, crisis that uh, where both the economy of France, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, even Spain and Italy, each of them separately are larger than their Russian uh, economy and of course J Japan as well. So there is a lot of US allies that are much larger, I won't say much, but they are larger separately. Uh, than the Russian economy. So they cannot really develop those aid packages, th those investment packages that China can. Uh, and you still have a lack of cooperation uh, between China and uh, uh, Russia. It's some fair between the countries still, although they have been sliding more closer together, uh, but you can still see some distrust between the two. So that's to a certain extent the Russian weaknesses. But ladies and gentlemen, Russia also have advantages, basically. Uh, Russia doesn't have that strong tie to their world economic system. And we see that they act more as a spoiler. That means that they, they don't necessarily need to care that much about the international structure as maybe China does. We also see that Putin has actually been a rather good player. And we also see that Russia can, and it does draw upon so former Soviet era connections in East Africa. Uh, a lot of the officers in the Ethiopian army, the Somali army still, although they're getting old, are Frunze educated. They are products of the old Soviet system to a certain extent. And there are ties, historical ties there. And last but not least, there are strong ties when it comes to the weapon systems and military uh, systems of the Soviet, old Soviet era. It's still a lot of it in the war. Uh, and uh, basically a deep influence in some of the armies, a tempting partner because they can service those old weapon systems, they can keep them up to date, and they can bring in spare parts. So they are tempting purely militarily, perhaps to a larger extent than basically uh, China. They can still produce a lot of cheap weapons and uh, still have the status of the second largest arms exporter in Africa. So they actually, when it comes to the hard power supply, the supply of arms and ammunition, they are, have a stronger position than basically uh, the Chinese. Uh, they also have a keen interest in mineral and natural resource extraction, and that has led to a lot of competence. There is a lot of Russian competence and know-how when it comes to uh, uh, mineral and natural resource extraction. And we've seen that basically play out in a lot of places. In Sudan, in Eritrea, we've seen Russian experts coming in and dealing with this. And uh, we also seen highlighted last summer how important uh, Russia can be. They have a lot of military agreements around Africa. Uh, what they did last summer was to strike a military agreement with Abia. They cannot put in reinforcements to Abia. They don't have any paratroopers uh, or any quick reaction forces that they can push in. What they do have is a lot of maintenance capacity. And after the losses of President Abia in uh, Tigray uh, during last summer, basically that must have been like sent from heaven for him because all, it seems like the Ethiopian army totally faltered and a lot of the fighting today is done by ethnic militias rather than the original Ethiopian army. So the heavy in demand of resupplies and the Russians can perhaps attach themselves. But there we also see the Russian strategy having similarities with the Chinese strategies, you know, taking advantage perhaps much more, uh, much more active, uh, much more active role um, and taking advantage of basically American alienation from some of the par uh, countries in the Horn. But the same thing goes for uh, Russia. Uh, as for China, you know, some of those alienated partners are not really stable. So they had their ups and downs as well. Uh, we have to be careful uh, basically about the Russian model and the way that the Russian model functions. We talk, uh, we talk, uh, uh, no, Ukraine is very much put on the agenda. There's a lot of talk in uh, about hybrid warfare when it comes to Ukraine. And uh, if you look into the Russian current system, basically, uh, 
it seems like it's ideally suited for hybrid uh, warfare because it's so fragmented and you might think this is very strange how can a lecturer say that it's ideally suited for warfare when it's fragmented uh, you have several researchers suggesting that basically Kremlin's foreign policy, Russian foreign policy, is basically consisting of a set of private actors that are trying to please Kremlin rather than out of necessity having a, a, a basically um, a basically direct Kremlin having a direct control over them. So it's a kind of private entrepreneurship nevertheless that wants to suck up to the president in in moscow uh, so that means that it's actually harder to control for united states it's harder to spot the links sometimes uh, because they mo the actors the agents there might not be directly run from moscow they rather report in because of some common ideas and common links so it's not a direct putin generalships controlling these actors but they're coming back to him nevertheless so, so uh, that set, uh, basically, where you have political entrepreneurs, you have business entrepreneurs, you have journalists, it is, uh, at least, sorry, and even or sometimes organized criminal groups, private actors, that's a kind of set that Russia is deploying, not always strategically, but deploying to uh, actually work for their benefits. And I think the combination of the M Invest case in Sudan and the Wagner Group, is very interesting where you have the owner one of the owners of the wagner group which of course most of you would know it's a kind of pr uh, private entity uh, very close to the putin presidency owned by uh, one of his friends in partnership with others uh, basically was involved in supporting bashir uh, and when they were involved with the supporting bashir they got mineral concessions so the company m invest entered in to Sudan to, to extract uh, basically natural resources. It is, as far as I remember, it was not even registered in, in uh, Russia. It was registered outside of Russia, but owned by some of the same owners as the Wagner Group. And uh, basically, uh, what happened next was that the Wagner Group also were allowed to intervene in the Central African Republic. So they used Sudan as a base. Uh, the Wagner Group was also entrenched into a Sudan, the Sudanese military forces. So it wasn't, these connections wasn't properly ended after the removal of Bashir. Those connections are still there. And now we see that the uh, deeper echelons of the Sudanese army are stepping a little bit back, taking more power. And some of these echelons still have connections with Russia. So even the rupture uh, with uh, Bashir wasn't a full end to that type of investment from the Russian uh, side. And uh, Bashir, the case of Bashir's removal uh, in uh, 2019 shows the strengths of the Russian approaches, but also the limitations of the Russian approaches. We can see that, uh, you know, uh, the Wagner Group wasn't able to help out, but we see that the Russians tried to use private, uh, private security to help out Bashir. We also more interestingly, perhaps see that the Russians deployed so-called troll factories in the support of Bashir. And that's kind of historical uh, outside of Europa, outside of North America, we saw the Russians use their troll factories in support of their allies in Africa. So it's a kind of a very fresh case uh, of uh, the deployment of troll factories. And there is a lot of online debate in, in these countries. So it's uh we don't fully really know the influence on politics of those online debates but uh, the troll factories can be rather efficient there is speculations but i cannot fully really say that they are proven that we see the same troll factories deployed in the ethiopian civil war now that st petersburg the troll factories in st petersburg and other places indeed are active in supporting abia but we need more evidence on this case. But it's very clear and it's proven that they were involved on Bashir's uh, side. What happened, of course, was that Bashir lost nevertheless. So there are weaknesses with those tools, but they are basically uh, there. We also see that the Russia as uh, basically China has a kind of uh, non-intervention and sovereignty uh, protecting agenda in the UN. 
uh, where they try to uh, protect their allies also when they are doing human rights transgressions locally uh, against uh, uh, EU and you know uh, American uh, basically uh, sanctions or resolutions in the UN system and in other foras indeed. So uh, that also has its limitations, but it buys popularity in some cases uh, from, from some of these countries. So uh, what we see is Russia perhaps being more of a spoiler in relations to uh, the Horn of Africa politics than China to a certain extent, in, in, the, in the sense that China has very clearly defined strategies, uh, harnessing natural resources, securing the logistical chain, stopping uh, sanctions, stopping uh, resolutions in the UN with regards to Taiwan, Uyghurs, etc., etc., uh, while Russian strategies sometimes have a more stronger spoiling element, basically targeting more directly the United States, trying to undermine basically uh, United States, but you can also see attempts by Russia to uh, basically influence global supply lines. And uh, that, so they had a keen interest in the Bab el Mandeb and securing a naval base in the Bab el Mandeb. But that also showed the United States strength because they tried and tried again and again. They tried in Sudan. It ended up becoming a big game between United States and Sudan, basically. Uh, uh, where United States was outbidding Russia. Uh, so there isn't any naval base in Sudan yet. They tried in Eritrea. Eritrea was rather reluctant, or possibly because they were afraid of United States reaction. They tried in Djibouti. In Djibouti, again, uh, basically, they were outbidded by the United States. The United States gave more foreign aid and as well putting pressure on the Djiboutian government. And they tried in Somaliland, and it's kind of fizzled out because Somaliland also wanted to prioritize the United States uh, actually over 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 uh, over the Russians. So we see here the limitations of Russian power. We see that the Russians are to a le much lesser extent, but it's there a kind of limited access to natural resources. Uh, it's not as tempting for them as. China because they have a large reserves of some of the natural resources that are in the area, but also because their economy is weaker, they don't have the necessary uh, power to reinvest so that this will basically uh, be a good business for them. So, so uh, Russia, in a strange way, it's stronger than China when it comes to hard power but much weaker than China when it comes to soft power. But they have a toolkit that China doesn't always have, as well as China having a more economic toolkit that uh, Russia doesn't always possess. So there are limitations, absolutely, to uh, Russian strategies. Yeah, so Russia will go to support the international paria. They supported South Sudan when nobody else supported South Sudan. They liked Bashir when nobody else liked Bashir. Today, they uh, kind of celebrate Abir. Uh, but Bashir didn't hold up. You know, there is a place, uh, there is a price when you support dictatorships that are unstable. And very often, that instability is what gives the Russians access in the first place. You know, that you have a country who is in turmoil, uh, maybe a strongman who needs some kind of support, doesn't get it from the West, doesn't get it from the EU, the Chinese cannot deliver, then Russians have a window of opportunity. But that window of opportunity is created by weakness itself. Uh, and uh, even though it seems like they are buying themselves in with the Abiy regime, we have to remember that, uh, well, there has been anti-American demonstrations in Addis Ababa, well, there has been pro-Russian demonstrations in Addis Ababa because of their, that engagement, but it's not the old-style Soviet interventions. You know, Soviet have intervened in the Horn before. They intervened in 77, 78, and then they airlifted 7, 17,000 Cubanese fighters. They uh, airlifted, I think, around 3,000 South Yemeni fighters. They put in, I think, 72 fighter planes they sent down there and uh, in incredible amount of tanks. I don't remember, but it must have been maybe more than 300 at least. So there was a big airlift. 
that's something that took place in the past. That's not something Putin can do today. Uh, so it's an increased engagement compared to 10 years ago, but it's still weak compared to the Soviet Union. What we see here is not a resurrected Soviet Union. And uh, we also see the limitations of Russian engagements. China secured a base in Djibouti, Russia failed. Russia has tried so many times in so many countries and non-recognized countries like Somaliland, but they fa failed over and over again. So it seems like United States is uh, able to uh, outcompete them, at least in this game. I think that was uh, my presentation. Uh, I don't know how you want to do it, Christopher, if we open up for questions or... Yes, thank you very much. So we will uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, if you could just use the raise hand function and I'll call you in the order that I see you. And if you could just briefly also identify yourself before asking your question for Dr. Hansen. Jorn, please. Um, so thank you for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Jörn Quiller. I'm a uh, faculty advisor here at uh, Marine Corps University and also a Norwegian Army officer. Um, so um, thank you for, for uh, bringing in the Norwegian perspective into the Horn of Africa. Um, so my, my two questions really, uh, the first one is, um, can China be forced into security problems in the Horn of Africa, um, forced into intervening into to security issues in order to protect their investments? Um, so that's the first question. The other is, um, are there any signs of uh, demands from uh, different African countries um, how the China is, is doing their business? Uh, uh, for instance, using more local uh, labor, uh, environmental concerns and, and other issues that we see China is not very focused on, um, which is more uh, limited uh, or limiting factor for the United States and, and Europeans uh, doing business in Africa. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, with regards to the first question, it's uh, we've seen instances in Ethiopia a couple of years ago where uh, China believed that when they were going to drill for oil in the contested Ugadan region, that they could do this unpolitically that they, it was a kind of a neutral external actors. And we saw that uh, they were attacked. And uh, there was also, uh, Chinese were also scared uh, of Shebab uh, uh, attacks, uh, Harakat al-Shebab. Uh, Harakat al-Shebab is actually an anti-Chinese movement. They've been targeting uh, China when it comes to the Uyghurs in their propaganda in the past. Uh, but the way that China solved this was rather to approach Ethiopians and enhance their security. So that's what we see now, that they tried to leave the local security uh, basically to uh, the local, uh, the, the local uh, country in large. There are some Chinese security personals there, but not, not uh, massively so. So in large delegated weight security. That actually reminds a little bit sometimes about some of the Norwegian companies that has been engaged in the region. Uh, and and uh, with the regards to the second question, you know, it, my answer to that question depends a little bit about which state you're talking about. There is a, definitively a large uproar in countries that are allowed to have such uproars manifested. So if you look into uh, Kenya, you know, Kenya has a relatively well-functioning institutions you know they still have a strong civil debate they still have a strong media debate so some of the harshest critique that i've seen ever in the parliament of china i've seen in kenya and i have to we shouldn't probably talk about this uh, my fellow norwegian but i was actually a little bit envious of that debate when i saw in the past how the norwegian parliament has treated china because it was much opener much more harsh from the uh, Kenyan side and or there has been a lot of media manifestations in uh, in Kenya of racism amongst the Chinese uh, you know I'm, uh, one of the famous histories was in my article I write about a, a restaurant owner who didn't want to serve uh, basically Kenyans at all because he was basically publicly saying that they were dirty 
Uh, and uh, also, as you say, the use of Chinese personnel. So that has led to a lot of parliamentarian debates. And uh, there is animosities towards China in, in Kenya. They try to compensate by investing in basically high profile investments. Like they uh, made the Trans uh, Nairobi railway system uh, and the Mombasa Nairobi uh, new railway system, but it's not fully compensated. So uh, they have. They have some issues in Kenya, and Kenya is perhaps where the Chinese are worst off when it comes to influence. But if you look into other authoritarian systems, of course, it's harder to manifest such animosities. In Bashir Sudan, you know, it is almost impossible. Even present-day Sudan is almost impossible because it's too strong military control. They will hit down on those voices. They will be censored. So we cannot, maybe they are there, but we won't know about them. And my suspicions is that if something happens in Ethiopia, you will have the relatively same, uh, same, uh, same, same, uh, same results. We also have, of course, the the massive debt that uh, several countries have run into when it comes to China. But the most striking striking example is perhaps not in uh, the Horn. It's Sri Lanka. You had the debt crisis. What you see is some countries in the Horn, especially Ethiopia, and more so Djibouti, are running into that trap. So they're running into a Chinese debt trap, and you can see that. But you see, for example, Kenya trying to diversify, and basically uh, Somalia not having that much interest by anybody in the, when it came to investment. And then you see Eritrea who doesn't want to have investment. So on the other hand, you have countries like Kenya, Somalia, and Eritrea who doesn't really, it's not strong, although the Eritreans are very secretive. It doesn't seem like there is a lot of debt to China in regard to the total debt burden. And if it's a small percentage of the total debt burden, you know, there's means to restructure those that debt. Uh, the, 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 uh, there is, however, an important lesson from your lecture and from your question, sorry. And that is, we should definitely think about debt restructuring if we want to counter Chinese influence. That will come on the agenda, but it might come there in the longer run. And in uh, the Horn, maybe the places to watch is Djibouti, Ethiopia, and to a much less extent, Sudan. Uh, yeah, so that's my long answer to your question. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Hansen? Yes, Jens, please. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, my question relates to um, uh, the, the UN uh, Security Council meeting last week, where uh, where Somalia uh, rejected to extend the uh, counter piracy uh, resolution on, on uh, foreign state uh, ships operating in Somalia waters. Uh, could, could I ask you, sir, to elaborate on, uh, on, on the Chinese and the, the Russian perspective on this uh, power vacuum that, that possibly will arise off the coast, bearing in mind that some of the illegal fishing that takes place is actually most likely Chinese vessels, so they might have a biased or a two-sided uh, approach to this. Yeah, so uh, China also have a fishing, uh, extensive fishing agreement with the Somali state, which is kind of weird because we don't know much about it. And secondly, you know, one of the issues here is that there is a lot of rumors about corruption in regards to the signing of that fishing agreement. So, so. Uh, I think for China, it's probably, a, you're right, it's probably a lot of unregulated fishing, but there are opportunities that can be taken advantage of. And the Faramaggio government has see, basically been weak in relation to China, and they grew unpopular because of this. But the, in the defense, I don't want to defend Faramaggio that much because I think he's a little bit a danger also to us. Uh, but, but in the defense of Faramaggio, I might say that the, he has so little enforcement capacity anyway. So, you know, uh, why don't get some money out of China for doing what China maybe will do anyway? Uh, as far as I know, you know, that yeah, the, the capacity of the Somali Coast Guard is four or five ships or something like that. And uh, so we, if you talk about the naval presence in Somalia, it's much more important to talk about Puntland and, and, and Somaliland. And, 
that's also not very great, <laughs> but but it's better than than uh, Faramato. So he doesn't have that much uh, uh, options, and he, to a certain extent, he managed to co-opt uh, the Chinese. And I don't think that's basically a Russian issue. I think the Russians are watching the possibilities for a resurgence of piracy. So are the Chinese. But uh, on the other hand, both Russia and China are also uh, aware that the preparations of the international community is so much better now when it comes to use or legislation, when it comes to the use of private guards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't think that there's a belief that this will really research. Uh, so I, I, basically what I'm saying is that the Russians probably don't care that much, but they are watching keenly for uh, resurgence of piracy but they I, I, I and the chinese can live with it you know because they have so good access to faramajo question is who's going to win the elections and they, if uh, their elections are rigged because that might be turned around if the uh, president hassan or some of the old presidents wins the election you know then china might be uh, it might be renegotiated if it's not renegotiated then probably the chinese need to pay a little bit extra money to to the new president i, I presume yeah hey, dr hansen there's a question from major gabriel gassi from uh, mcu's command and staff college if china is only defensively posturing in africa uh, i completely understand it's based in djibouti the issue of piracy for example however there have also been reports recently that it is pursuing similar basing in Equatorial Guinea. And if this is true, um, do you think that this, by pursuing a base on the Atlantic, fits in with China's strategy in Djibouti? Is there sort of a, a link between those two, those two strategies? Or are they part of rather the same strategy in terms of expanding their influence on the continent? I, I think there it's possible to see those uh, bases as kind of testing the waters. So, uh, you know, uh, what we've seen so far is Chinese, uh, you know, the, the biggest achievement is basically getting UN resolutions stopped or uh, getting some UN resolutions in support of what they're doing with uh, uh, some of their more controversial uh, domestic issues. That's right. But that's also because of their limited force protection capacity in those areas. So we might see careful attempts to try out some of these bases in relations to showing off the flag but i do think that's far in the future so the, the djibouti base has limited capacity it was good to fight pirates even then they needed other logistical support arrangements uh, and they did have a massive deployment in relations to piracy but uh, but still of limited value but we might see some developments going in in that direction and in order for making that efficient we need to see major base expansions as well if it's going to be really a capacity to show the flag thank you um so are there any other questions for dr hansen if not i will use sort of co-host prerogative um so what do you make uh, what what are your thoughts on sort of the competition sort of ongoing between the united states and china in ethiopia particularly not only because it's arguably alongside Kenya, the most sort of prominent and, and influential country in, in the region, in the Horn in the region, but also in terms of Chinese. We saw recently in, in, in late last year, the sort of uh, with the envoys, sort of the dueling envoys. And 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 you mentioned the possibility of, of not only China, but Russian troll factories with regard to the Tigray, the ongoing conflict in, in Ethiopia uh, uh, between the federal government and uh, the TPLF or whatever we want to call the the, the Tigray uh, regional forces, but also with more recently with the the Grand Renaissance Dam, sort of Chinese involvement or investment in that. So what what do you sort of see as the kind of the current state of play in in, in Ethiopia, and, and how important do you think it is to both the United States, but also sort of the Chinese sort of grander sort of strat strategic visions. Mm. I think what's interesting for me, and it might be interesting for the audience also, what we see here has actually been one of the bigger rifts and discussion in the American research community, where you have uh, veteran researchers like Alex Deval, perhaps arguing on a more uh, harsh line towards Abi, uh, while you have uh, some younger researchers as Bronwyn Burton on the Atlantic Council, arguing that uh, basically they, uh, you shouldn't get in bed too closely with the TPLF. So there has been a lot of ruptures. 
what we have seen here is that the Russians and the Chinese are on the offensive when it comes to Abi. Uh, so there is stronger feelings amongst the Abi supporters uh for especially the russians actually uh but also a little bit the chinese so that it reminds about mali where you also saw some similar feelings uh and we should remember that both of these parties are actually well entrenched and supported so uh, the ethiopian civil war is not going to uh, end very soon i think i hope of course i'm wrong and that we will see some kind of in intervention by for example kenya in in fixing this uh, but I think it, this will be ongoing and it will be a price to pay for the Russians as well. Because if you believe me and it's going to be a long war, then we don't know the result. What we know if the Russians get in bed with Abiyah, for sure, if this gets too tough, the Tigrayans will be anti-Russians. And the Tigrayans are also good fighters. You know, the, This war hasn't ended yet. They have a lot of problems. They have, lack logistic support. They don't have any air capacity uh, but still they have a long tradition of guerrilla fighting running back to 1975 and they were very good at it it's entrenched in the tigrayan culture uh, so there's a sacrifice for uh, for abi uh, that doesn't mean that the united states should go in and support the tigrayans though as for now i, I think it's this uh, a conflict that uh, uh, united states can can watch and, and uh, sit a little bit on the uh, on the fence and watch because uh, you know it will draw out and it's not sure that the Russians will get the upper hand in the long run when people are tired of the fighting or the you know, front lines are changing and so so uh, there's the Russians are on the offensive in Ethiopia and it seems like they're gaining uh, but the question is if those gains of the russians are really sustainable in the long run and if they are worth the price for united states in actively going in for example militarily which i think is ridiculous you shouldn't do that uh to counter them you know maybe it's not worth the price for if for the americans or the russians but it, it's developments that should be watched nevertheless I, if I were United States, I would probably consolidate and concentrate of consolidating the Kenya and the United States friendship, also because Kenya is actually one of the most stable countries in this uh, area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, last call, are there any questions for Dr. Hansen? Additional questions? If not, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Major Brown to close us out. Yeah, nothing really to add from my end. Uh, this will be posted on our our YouTube channel and our various other um, digital channels here in the next couple of days, so you can revisit all the comments. Dr. Hansen, uh, appreciate your time for being here. For everybody else, thank you for joining us in the audience, and we will see you for the next med lecture here in the near future. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.